If you've got a Bible, I hope you do, but if you don't, I hope you have a pen and paper and that you can write some things down. Not just yet, but I will. I'm going to go to Revelation and I'm going to just take a look at a couple verses in Revelation chapter 13. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I believe that uh, right now we are in prophecy living out Revelation chapter 13. And I'm going to start with verse 12. I'm not here to prove uh, uh, everything. A lot of this I'm assuming you're going to know, but I just need to give the framework to it. It says, uh, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. In Bible prophecy, what, can somebody tell me what nation that is? That is the United States, and that is very provable. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. In other words, whatever this beast, this United States power is, it has the appearance of a lamb. But as soon as it speaks, what's it speak like? Now when it says it has the appearance of a lamb, that ought to take us to a thought. What is, when you think of a lamb in the Bible, what do you think of? You think of Lord Jesus Christ, right? So this nation is going to have an appearance of benevolence, of goodness, that would be like a lamb, like Jesus Christ. But when it speaks, it speaks like a dragon. And the dragon has the connotation of what? Of the devil, of Satan, of the old serpent, of Lucifer. So it says that there's a nation, the United States, that is going to appear, when it comes up out of the earth, it's going to appear like a lamb. Before that nation is done, when it speaks, it's going to speak like a dragon. Its appearance, its profession is the same. But its speaking and action is different than its appearance. Do you understand? Okay, then you've got the context. And then it says, And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that even he, he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That's an important concept right there. This power is going to have the ability to do miracles. You have got to have a faith at the end of the world that goes beyond what you see. You've got to have a faith that grasps the eternal unseen to not be deceived by what you're seeing. Do you understand what I'm saying? And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. I'm suggesting to you that we are seeing this happen right in front of our eyes. Our nation is changing daily. We are giving away what generations have fought for and died for. We are giving away. It is happening right in front of us. We are going to see that. And we've got to be prepared for it. Does that make sense to you? Okay, I'm going to talk about a couple things. I'm going to develop this a little bit more, but so you can know where I'm going. I'm going to talk about ordination. Ordination of women. Topic of ordination tonight. A little bit. And I'm going to talk about the topic of spiritual formation a little bit. Have you heard that phrase? Spiritual formation. 
Well, it's in a lot of publications, and there's a lot of debate going on, and so I'm going to refer to both of them. But I want you to know where I'm going with this. I'm just trying to set a context of the talking. Does, does that make sense? Has anybody ever, maybe, maybe I'm not going to do this. So maybe let me back up. I just saw everybody shake their head no when I said, have you heard of spiritual formation? So maybe I'm not going to talk about that so much. Has anybody ever heard of the topic of ordination? Because if you haven't heard of that, I'm not going to talk about that either. We're going to have closing prayer and I'm going to go home and say, praise God. <laughs> Has anybody heard about the topic of ordination? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. So, so I am going to talk about that. We are about to go through a difficult time. I can't stop that time. You can't stop that time. It is going to happen. But we've been cautioned and warned to prepare for that time. And that's why I think it's important for us to talk about this stuff. It's interesting to me that the moment you hear the word image, worship, and kill you if you don't worship the image, that ought to cause you to think about a story in the Bible. What story should that cause you to think about? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3 is referred to in Revelation that story is particularly for those who will live at the last days of this earth's history. The same language is used. We ought to pay particular attention to it. You say, you said we're going to talk about ordination. I am. I am going to. But again, I'm going to set the context. So I want to just go through a series of verses right now. And you should write these verses down if you don't have a Bible. And you should look them up. And uh, by the way, let's do the handout right now. So you don't have to write them down. Because your first sheet will be these verses. So if you could just have these passed out, I'd appreciate that. <clears throat> Is the first sheet a list of verses? Do you know? It's not? No, I didn't get that one. Oh, you didn't get that one? Okay, that's all right. This is the way there. Okay, right. then you're going to have to write them down. But just write them down on the first page there, so at least you have something. Okay, first verse. It's going to be in Acts chapter 17. And I just want to demonstrate something out of the Bible. Do you see a problem attaching the word worship and kill? Do you see a problem with that? Then somebody tell me what the problem is. Say that loud. Forced worship is a worship of love. Okay, so a forced worship is a problem, right? So problem with either worship this way or you're going to be killed is a huge issue. Would you, would you guys agree to that? Do you think that is applicable to anything that's happening in the world today? Do you know people are being killed right now? Yes. Because of coerced worship? Do you understand that's happening? And that's going to happen to a greater extent? The Bible predicts that. Do you know that's been a problem from Genesis to Revelation? Who was the first person killed? Abel. And why was he killed? Over the issue of worship. I fully believe that the first person killed, recorded in Genesis, was killed over the issue of worship. I fully believe 
that before Jesus comes, the last one killed is going to be over the same issue. This issue has torn humanity to pieces for 6,000 years. And you and I are going to see the final battle of the war. And it's going to be pretty rough. How do we get there? How do we get the word kill and worship in the same sentence? Because that shouldn't even happen. How does it get there? I want to show you something. Go to Acts chapter 17. And I just want to look at verses 26 and 28. Acts 17, verses 26 to 28. Listen to this. This is Paul speaking. And he says, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. When it says he has made, who is the he? God. So I can read, and God has made from one blood every nation of men. How many nations of men? So does that mean China? Iraq? Indonesia? The United States? Okay, all right. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. So who's determined that? And I'm going to ask that one more time. Are you sure of that? Who has determined the dwellings and boundaries of the nations? According to the Bible, God has done that. Now, if you study history, history doesn't say that. History says those boundaries are set by the strength of armies. But God says that's not true. God says, I set the boundaries to those nations. Why does God do that? I'm going to read this again quickly. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Why has God set the boundaries to nations? So that nations will seek after him. So that those nations will see that there is a power greater than their power. In other words, that's reflective of Nebuchadnezzar saying, And who is this God that will deliver you out of my hands? God allowed that to happen so he would ask that very question. Then he revealed himself to Nebuchadnezzar. And you know what? Nebuchadnezzar became a Christ follower. Nebuchadnezzar will be in heaven. You say, well, how do you know he became a Christ follower? Because he said, did not we cast three men into the furnace? But do I not see four? And the fourth is like the Son of God. Who is the Son of God? It's Jesus Christ. He became a Christ follower. And he will be in heaven. So who sets the boundaries of the nations? God does. Okay, now I want you to look at Psalms 62, verse 11. Psalm 62, verse 11. And I'm going to start in verse 8. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. What's a vapor? Right? Surely men of low degree are... What does that mean? 
God. Yeah, we're here today and gone today. <laughs> we always used to say here today and gone tomorrow. But since I've been getting older and since Friday that I've been so sick, I've said it's here today and gone today. <laughs> Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. Why are they a lie? Because they think they're more than a vapor. So men of high degree put trust in their riches, thinking that that will protect them. So they're a lie. Your riches aren't going to protect you. Surely men of low degree are a vapor, men of high degree a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than a vapor. <laughs> Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Get this, verse 11. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Now who sets the boundaries to the nations? How many of the nations? All nations. So every nation in this world, according to the Bible, God has set the boundaries to that nation. Now the Bible is saying power belongs to who? It belongs to God. How much power belongs to God? All power belongs to God. All power belongs to God. That's a biblical concept. And the only place you're going to find that concept is in the Bible. If that is true, then what I'm about to say is true and it's important. If power or authority show up anywhere in the universe, it's either been delegated by God to that entity or that entity has usurped it and assumed it. Is that not correct? If all power belongs to God, and if you see power or authority show up anywhere, either it came from God or somebody is usurping the power and authority. Does that make sense? Then here's a principle. Write it down. Assumed power and authority always leads to persecution. Always. Assumed power and authority always leads to persecution. So let me go back. If Unless you worship the image of the beast, you will be killed. That power isn't from God. Somebody is assuming that power. Somebody is assuming that authority. Assumed power and authority always leads to persecution. Now here comes the test. Did you say assumed with the D on the end? Yes. Or usurped is a good word too. If somebody assumes power and authority, what is it ultimately going to lead to? There's the test. Persecution. Thank you very much. Okay. You get an A. <laughs> it is always that way. There's never an exception to that. And 6,000 years of human history teaches us that. And I could go through sighting after sighting of proving that very thing if I needed to. But for right now, that, that is a framework that I'm trying to build. Because ultimately, what are we going to talk about? Ordination. Ordination, okay. Now I want you to go to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Get this. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. So I used in Psalms, I used the word power and authority. The reason I'm doing that because I've got a verse to back up the word authority. There is no authority except from who? So why should I be subject to the civil government? Because 
God has given them the authority because there is no authority except it comes from God. And you say, but Dean, that's just spiritually. No, it's not spiritually because who set the boundaries to the nations? Man, that's a civil issue. That's not a religious issue. The border between Canada and the United States is not a religious issue. It's a civil issue. And who set that border? God set that border. Who gives Canada their authority? Who gives the U.S. their authority? Yeah, God does. So it says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And that brings a point of tension. So I've got one story that I pointed you to that says there's a time and place to say no. And now I've got a verse that says, be subject to the governing authorities. How in the world did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego know when they went out on the plain of Dura to stand there when they know that Nebuchadnezzar has been given the kingdom from God? In fact, I can show you that in the book of Isaiah, that Isaiah prophesied that the king of Assyria, Babylon, God would give him world control. So these three guys are standing there saying, this king has been given world control. We are slaves to him because God said so. And now, how do you know when to say no? It's against God's will. Because Nebuchadnezzar assumed some authority. Because Nebuchadnezzar assumed or usurped an authority. And all assumed or usurped authority leads to what? All I have to do is look at that fiery furnace and I know that what he's doing is not right. So get this. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So if the authority is not from God, it is no authority. Because all authority comes from God. And if what they're saying is not from God, it is no authority. So quickly, here's the point. Nebuchadnezzar says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I want you on the plain of Dura. What did they do? Went to, the Went to the plain of Dura. Why? Because he's the authority. If he said go to that city, they'd go to that city. If he said come here, they'd come there. If he said go do that, they'd go do that. Come to the plain of Dura. Okay. So in coming to the plain of Dura, they acknowledge the lawful authority of Nebuchadnezzar God given. Then Nebuchadnezzar says, now bow down and worship. And they just stand there. Do you know what's sad? They were the only three standing there. What was everybody else doing? We had better get very clear on civil disobedience. We had better get very clear on recognizing what is authority from God and what's a usurped and assumed authority. To know when it's time to stand and when it's time to bow. We better get very clear on that. That is true. Never. That God never gives the authority for worship to any individual or any organization. Huh? Yeah, there's no individual, there's no organization that can demand worship. The moment we see that, it is time for disobedience even if it means death. Do you see that? Okay, then I am going to just give you some other verses. I'm not going to read them for the sake of time. But write them down. Daniel 4, 17. Daniel 22, 28. Daniel 2, 21. Isaiah 46, 10 through 11. 
And those are same verses that will prove this point. That there's no authority, there's no power, except it come from God. Here's what we're facing in the United States right now. I think that one text was Psalm 22, 28. Uh, Daniel, oh yeah, Psalms 22, 28. Sorry, it's Daniel 2, 21. Yeah. Here's what we're seeing in the United States right now. And I'm certainly no expert on governing governments what's happening around the world but I am getting to travel quite a bit to other countries and I'm getting to watch and what I'm about to say I'm seeing everywhere it is unbelievable to me leadership in the world right now especially in America really reflects this principle we are going to do what we're going to do no matter what, until somebody stops us. That's right. It doesn't matter if there's a constitution or no constitution. Government leaders today, the moment you say constitution, it is as if that document doesn't even exist. We are just going to do what we're going to do until somebody stops us. That is a problem. And you say, well, Dean, you're, you're now moving towards uh, uh, saying something about a political party. I, I certainly am. Both of them. Everywhere I go in the world today, I see leaders just acting as if they're kings. That they're going to do what they're going to do irrespective of any boundary, irrespective of anybody else until somebody stops them. That is not what this country was founded on. Now that's going to become hugely important. Now I'm going to go to this. You say we are going to talk about our nation? Yes, yes. The reason I'm, going to, I'm doing it this way, please get this if I'm not making it clear. The reason I'm doing it this way, because the topic of ordination to me is a side issue. And I'm not saying it's not an important issue. I'm not saying it's an issue the church doesn't have to make a decision on. But to me, it's a side issue. The things that I'm talking about right now are what the issue is. And to me, we'd better get clear on it. And we'd better understand the ground we're standing on. So now I get to hear all kinds of comments, meeting after meeting, paper after paper, books have been written uh, for ordination of women, against ordination of women. I hear all kinds of things being said. I attend meetings where the number one topic that's being talked about every time is that topic. I mean, you guys are seeing it, obviously you've heard about it. And I just, and I'm looking, I'm reading, I'm trying to figure out and all of a sudden, I'm beginning to hear all kinds of things that are just inaccurate from both sides. People who are for ordination of women are saying things, and I'm saying, wait a minute, that's not, that's not right. People who are opposed to the ordination of women, they're saying things, they're saying, wait a minute, that's not right. And I'm saying that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been known for one thing. Now, I don't know if we're going to continue to be known for this, but we have been known for one thing, and that is that we're people of the Bible. So wherever the Bible leads us, so far our reputation has been wherever the Bible leads us, that's where we've been, able, we've been willing to go, even if it's to go where we haven't been before. In other words, everybody was keeping the first day of the week, and lo and behold, we come to the teaching of the Sabbath. So what does the Advent movement do? They begin to follow the Sabbath irrespective of anything. Why? Because the Bible led them that way. And all the distinctive teachings that we have now that have come down through the Reformation and finally to us have been teachings that have gone now that we've received from the Word of God that the majority of Christianity doesn't hold. So we've been people of the Bible, people of the book. 
So I want to now paint the context for the discussion of ordination. What I'm saying, I don't think you're going to hear anywhere else. So that ought to tell you something right there and be cautious. But I'm confident enough in what I'm saying that I'm willing to do it publicly. And here's why this becomes important. I am not going to settle tonight the issue of ordination. But you elected me as a conference president. And I'm going to demonstrate to you why I'm doing this. Because if you don't like what I'm about to say tonight, you need to unelect me. Or convince me that what I'm saying is wrong. Because this is the ground that I'm going to stand on. This is the ground I'm standing on. And what I'm saying here is what I'm going to say in the meetings that I'm setting in. And if you don't like that, then you need to do something about it. I'm not about to stand here and tell you what I think you want to hear to be elected. That means nothing to me. But eternal life does mean something to me. And I've got to be clear to my own conscience. And you've got to be clear to your conscience. And either what I'm saying is right, and if it is, then you need to be standing right where I'm standing, no matter what. But if what I'm saying is wrong, then you need to vote me out and you need to do it pretty quick. And either one's okay with me. I'm not trying to be melodramatic, but we are at the end of the world and huge issues are being talked about and we need to know the ground we're standing on. Does that make sense? Okay. You're not going to hear this anywhere else, I don't think. But here. When God created, He created what? Man. Male and female. In the context of what? Well, thank you. It was in the context, it wasn't a man over here and a random woman over here and they wandered around for a while decided to date each other. It wasn't that Eve started winking at Adam or Adam started wooing Eve. She was created his wife. Day one. So in the very act of creation, the framework was husband, wife. Right? Do you know that that was the vehicle that God used for the transmission of the gospel message was the family that Adam and Eve taught their children. Then their children taught their children and their children taught their children. And that's how the plan of salvation was communicated was from parent to child, parent to child. Do you know how long that system lasted? Can somebody tell me? Basically about 1,500 years. Do you know what great event pretty much ended that system? The flood. Do you know what the condition of the world was at the flood? That every thought of human heart was evil. In fact, God said, I repent that I even made man. And by the way, I may not need to say this, but just as a lesson book, when he says, I repent that I made man, that is not a gender statement. In other words, he wasn't glad he made the women and repenting that he made the men. When he said, I repent that I made man, he's talking about humanity. Do you get that? If you get that principle, you're further along than some scholars that I'm reading right now. <laughs> okay. Okay, that system basically lasts until the flood. The family unit will continue on until the end of time. But the basic concept of the transmission of the gospel message moved from the family unit to what you have in front of you.
It lasted until the patriarchal system. Can somebody to give me a name of some patriarchs? Abraham, for sure, he was maybe the first. Uh, I, there's some question about that, but for sure Abraham is the first. In fact, when Jesus and Jesus in Jesus' day, the day, the Jews, when they went back, they said, we are the children of Abraham. So he was a patriarch. Do you understand that that became the system that God used to transmit the gospel was the patriarchal system? In other words, Abraham's camp was made up of numerous families. If you read it in Patriarchs and Prophets, she will say about a thousand people. His camp was made up of several families, but he was the patriarch. So when it came time for sacrifice, he offered the sacrifice. When it came time for worship, he was the worship leader. And that patriarchal system, as you have in front of you, was God-given. So God spoke directly to Abraham and gave Abraham specific promises that were given to Abraham alone. Do you understand that? And that's found in Genesis chapter 12, 3, but he's given it five times. He's given the promises five times. Those promises are specifically given to him in the context that every nation person in the world would be blessed through Abraham, which was a promise of who? of Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. So that patriarchal system. Then God spoke directly to Abraham and Abraham led the body of believers. Do you see that point? Okay, then who was the next patriarch after Abraham? Isaac. And who was the one after Isaac? Jacob. And then who after Jacob? Now this gets very interesting. Who after Jacob? Talk real loud. There were 12 of them. How do I know that? All I got to do is go to Revelation and what's written on the 12 foundations. Names of the apostles. What's written on the 12 gates. 12 tribes. So they became patriarchs. It expanded. Okay, how long did the patriarchal system last? Can somebody tell me that? Is the patriarchal system still going on today? It is not. It is not going on today. The patriarchal system lasts until the Levitical system. The patriarchal system went on to the Levitical system. Can somebody tell me the time when the patriarchal system ended? Moses. It was at the time of Moses, but what event? Exodus. Sinai taking the Golden calf. And how did the patriarchal shift system shift? Because Levi did not worship the golden calf, the other tribes did, and began a process from the patriarchal system to the Levitical system. When you get the verses in Exodus and Leviticus, that of Levi I have chosen and given Levi to you. So we began the Levitical system. And do you know what great rebellion took place right then? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And if you read about that in Patriarchs and Prophets, the problem was Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were patriarchs in their own families. They did not like it that Levi or that Aaron had been chosen out. So they rebelled against that. If you rebelled against the Levitical system, what happened to you? They were swallowed up by the ground, then fire broke out among the people and destroyed thousands of them that day. In other words, now all of a sudden we're getting the picture when God gives a system, that system is important. In other words, I could say, but wait a minute, God, you gave us the patriarchal system. And since you gave us the patriarchal system, I guess I'll just live under that system. Does that work? 
No, because God says no, because now I'm doing the Levitical system. And the Levitical system came with an anointing, a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Aaron. There was a special service for him and his sons, and promises were given. And if you sinned in that camp from that day on, who offered the sacrifice? The priest did. So do you understand that in the Levitical system, it was God given to the high priest, to other priests and Levites, and to the people. You did not go and worship God apart from the system that God established. And if you did, that was termed rebellion. Do you understand that? If the priest was corrupt, what would you do? You did not hold an election. They did not vote Levi in. They did not vote Levi out. They did not vote his sons in. They did not vote his sons out. If there was a problem, who took care of the problem? But if you said that priest is corrupt and I'm going to deal with him, what would happen to you even if the priest was corrupt? Then God is dealing with you. Do you understand that concept? How long did the Levitical system last? Somebody yell it out loud. To the crucifixion. What happened at the crucifixion? The veil in the temple torn from top to bottom signifying what? That something was transitioning. The Levitical system was gone. By the way, what did they do when that curtain was torn from top to bottom? They sewed it back up. Why did they do that? They didn't want to live under the new system. What was the new system? New system. Priesthood of all believers. Who is the high priest? Who, high priest. Who is the head of the church? Jesus Christ is. He's the high priest. When it says priesthood of all believers, what does that mean then? Okay, now, now this gets real interesting to me, Carol. You said we can go directly to him. We don't go through another person. We don't have to go through another person. Is that true? Is that true, guys? Huh? Okay, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. The three are in action. Priesthood of all believers. Christ is the high priest. When it says priesthood of all believers, what does that mean? Well, uh, thank you very much. It says priesthood of all believers. Can I see the hands of believers here tonight? Could everybody just please look around? Just hold your hands up and look around. Does anybody have a theological problem with the hands that you see raised? Any problem? Priesthood of all believers. It is not. The husband-wife relationship is intact. The vehicle for the transmission of the gospel has changed. In other words, Abraham had authority as a patriarch that no one else had. Levi, the tribe of Levi, Aaron had an authority that no one else had. The priest that served with Levi, in the tribe of Levi, they had an authority that no one else had. Do you understand that point? No one else could make the offering. 
No one else could do the sacrifice. And if you assumed the authority that the priest had, what happened to you? And if you don't remember, just go to the story of King Saul, who was waiting to go to battle. Samuel delayed and didn't come. And he said, if I don't do something, everybody's going to leave me. What was it? offer a sacrifice that is why he was rejected as king was because of the offering of that sacrifice he usurped an authority and what does usurped authority always lead to and who did he try to kill david listen you can test this out in any portion of the bible you want so the Levitical system was, yes, I have chosen the whole tribe to be priests and kings to the world, but that was still in the context of a Levitical system where high priest and Levi had duties and authority that no one else had. But now we have priesthood of all believers. What does that put that picture in your mind? First thing that comes to my mind is that when you talk about if a priest was corrupt, then it was really God's job to take care of it. And the people still had to obey. And so I'm thinking, looking around and I'm thinking, well, if some of us are corrupt, that's up to God to take care of, not me. Okay. That's a good comment. Priesthood of all believers. I'm going to draw it out a little bit. What's the picture it paints in your mind? We're seeing a progression. Patriarchal system. Levitical system. Priesthood of all believers. What's the picture? Okay. I'm going to just, because of time, I'm going to make some statements. You need to test this out. But I think that there's teachings of Christ that we are little observing today. And I'll give you an incident of that. Jesus said to the disciples, by the way, what was the number one topic of discussion among the disciples? Thank you very much. Who is the greatest? Why do you think they were thinking that? Levitical system. That's why they're thinking that because in their minds, Worship seems to be a hierarchical. But get this teaching. Jesus says, in the world, there are men of authority. And this is the way they rule. And then he describes it. But he says, but among you, it shall not be that way. For you are all Brother. And that is a powerful statement. You are all brethren. And I'm going to tell you, when I travel in and out among the churches, I see a lot of treatment that's not like brother. And I see a lot of people talking to each other that aren't talking to each other like they ought to talk to a brother and a sister. But we are all brethren. Among you, it shall not be that way. Priesthood of all believers. And that came with a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Can anybody tell me where that took place? In Acts chapter 2. How many were in that room? Huh? Yes, I'm testing you, but this is what I'm, I'm doing this for a particular reason. How many? 120. It's specific. It tells us how many were there and who were there. Men and women. And it specifically named some of the women. And how many of them spoke in tongues? All of them. How many received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? All of them did. So did Peter on that day receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a greater way than any of the other men? He did not. 
And I don't care what religious movement says he did. He did not. But now I'm going to press you. Did he receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit any greater than any woman in that room? He did not. It was the priesthood of all believers and specific promises were given. What system are we operating under now? Priesthood of all believers. And that will be the system that takes us to the end. There is not another transition coming. So when we talk about ordination, we cannot talk about ordination in the context of the patriarchal system. The patriarchal system is gone. You say, well, Dean, why do you say that? Because I read arguments that scholars are publishing. I, read, I hear arguments in meetings. People come to me and say, uh, Dean, a woman cannot do this because God never chose a woman for a patriarch. And I'm saying, so what? God never chose you as a patriarch either. <laughs> because there is no patriarchal system. And any attempt to rebuild a patriarchal system in the light of priesthood of all believers is rebellion to God. It's rebellion. We are not under a patriarchal system. We're under the priesthood of all believers. And you know what? Just recently somebody said it can't be women. Now you think, Dean, you're trying to make the point that women, no, I'm trying to set the context of the discussion. Somebody said, well, women can't do this because God never chose a woman as a priest. Now that's right. But there's just one problem with that argument. And what is the problem with that argument? He never chose a non-Jew as a priest either. He never chose anybody from the tribe of Judah to be a priest. He never chose, that's right, he did. But you know what? We're no longer under the Levitical system. The Levitical system is done. And any attempt to rebuild the Levitical system is what? It's rebellion against God. Now this is why it gets really important to me. And I'm going to get real serious about that. Because the Christian church is not acting as a priesthood of all believers. More than half of Christianity has the Levitical system. And you know what half of Christianity that is? It's the Roman church. Do you understand what I'm saying? And how do I know they have a Levitical system? Because they have a priest who they say has direct line to God and is given power and authority by God. Somebody can answer it be quite okay. <laughs> given power and authority by God. And if you want to go to God, you must go through that priest. And that's the establishment of the confessional. And that priest has assigned duties that only he can do, which is the Mass. And that's why the Roman Church will never give up the Mass. They will never do that. Because that would be a direct blow against the confessional. And they're not going to give that up. Because they're acting under the Levitical system. Guys, we don't preach sermons, although unfortunately we do. We don't just preach sermons against a Catholic church. We are preaching sermons against a Levitical system. And it doesn't matter where that Levitical system shows up. If we're Protestant Christians, we need to stand against it. Now, why am I telling you all of this? That's true, but why I told you why I'm telling you this tonight. Think. 
Yeah, but why am I telling you this tonight? That's right. Okay, I'm going to say it again. And if you don't remember it, then write it down. I'm telling you this because this is where I'm at. And when I go to a meeting next week, this is exactly what I'm going to be saying. And if you don't like that, you need to be telling me because you elected me as your conference president. But you did not elect my conscience. And I'm telling you the hill that I'm going to die on by God's grace. And it is not the hill of ordination of women. But it is the hill of Protestantism. Because I'm telling you right now, publicly, that I am not first a Seventh-day Adventist and then a Christian. I am first a Protestant and then a Seventh-day Adventist. Because a Protestant holds two things that Christianity, by and large, does not. Number one, the Bible is the authority of God. The Bible doesn't contain the authority of the Word of God. The Bible is the authority of the Word of God. And the Bible must hold together from Genesis to Revelation. And number two, we have direct access to the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not need to go through any man or organization. We can do it on our own, in our own living room, on our knees, direct access to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, I am never going to give that away. This is serious business. It is the priesthood of all believers. And if you do not understand what priesthood of all believers means, then get yourself educated. And don't be ignorant. And don't say stupid things. God never chose a patriarch as a woman. That is stupid. That is a dumb comment. That is Bible illiteracy. Don't say stuff like that. Be educated on what the Word of God says. Those scriptures are there for us to study. And the Bible says that a true Christian in the, right, in the last days must rightly divide the Word of God. And the Word of God is not up to your private interpretation. The Word of God must explain itself. And if you don't understand what priesthood of all believers means, then get out the Bible and read Acts chapter 2 and Peter will tell you what it means. And Peter says... Here's what priesthood of all believers means. Peter says, do not suppose that these are drunk. Since it's the third hour of the day, or ninth hour, whatever it is, third hour of the day I think it is. Do not suppose they are drunk. They are not drunk. This is the fulfillment of what prophecy? Joel chapter 2. Can anybody tell me what's in Joel chapter 2? That in the last days, your... Your sons and daughters. Prophesy, preach, dreams, speak the word of God. You understand? If you don't understand what priesthood of all believers means, then read Peter and Peter will tell you what it means. Sons and daughters. A shift is coming. The church struggled. Do you know where the first struggle was? What to do with Gentiles. What to do with Gentiles. And you know what? Those who argued against Gentiles use the same arguments that people use against women. I mean, God never called a Gentile for a priest. God never had them involved in the services. Yeah, and if you were talking about the Levitical system, all of that's true. Except what? The Levitical system is gone. Those arguments don't hold water. And do you know what settled the issue? What settled the issue was Peter standing up and said, With my own eye, I saw the Holy Spirit fall on them the same way it fell on us. And they spoke in tongues before they were circumcised. And that settled the issue. Listen, 
In these last days, God can call who he chooses. 